Thank you and welcome everyone, including those watching online, um, to this Atlantic Council panel discussion on strategic energy cooperation, Middle East relations, and the future of energy security in Asia. My name is Miyano. I'm the director of the Asia Security Initiative, housed within the Scott Cross Center for Strategy and Security here at the Council. This is the second set of events on US Japan energy. And uh, we hosted in March the first set of events and discussed about how Japan's newest strategic energy plan would develop and deliver significant uh, improvement in efficiency, emissions, cost, and self sufficiency by 2030 and 2050. How to diversify Japan's energy portfolio, both in terms of um, sources and suppliers, to meet its enhanced demands for energy security. How shift in the strategic landscape um, of the Indo-Pacific are prompting the United States to pursue new policies for regional engagement, including in the energy sector, through programs like Asia Edge and the Japan-US Strategic Energy Partnership, JUSEF and how the geopolitics of energy are shaping the long-term prospect for U.S.-Japan alliance. Today, we hope to discuss and address all of these questions, but rather by focusing on how to diversify Japan's energy portfolio in terms of suppliers, and how complex security and economic development in the Middle East, including the recent decisions by the U.S. government on Iranian oil and sanctions, are affecting Japan's strategic energy plans and the U.S.-Japan relations. Japan's strategic energy plan must also um, deal with these complex economic and security issues in the Middle East. And I hope that we can use today's session to uncover new insight into how the geopolitics of energy are shaping the long-term prospect for Japan's energy plan, the U.S.-Japan cooperation and Middle East relations and also their broader implications on energy security and geopolitics in Asia. Here in the Scowcroft Center, we work to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership in cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship um, of the next generation of leaders. I think today's topic touches upon uh, many of these issues and we're delighted to be conducting this event in collaboration with the Council's Global Energy Center, which promotes energy security by working alongside government, industry, civil society, and public stakeholders to devise pr pragmatic solutions to the geopolitical sustainability and economic challenges of the changing global energy landscape. As a reminder, this event will be webcast live and on the record. Please join the conversation on Twitter at AC Scowcroft and at AC Global Energy. And um, now I would like to introduce our panelists who are on the stage. And um, let me start by thanking three of you for being here today and um, introducing you to our audience. And um, to, to my left, Professor Koichiro Tanaka, Mr. Tanaka is a professor at Keio University, president of the Japanese Institute of Middle Eastern Economics, GIME Center, and a board member of the Institute of Energy Economics, Japan, IEEJ, and prior to becoming the, the president of the Middle Eastern program, Mr. Tanaka served as a senior analyst of the Iran program and the deputy director of second Middle East division of Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Bureau of Middle East and Africa. Next, we have Jay Nakano. Um, Nakano is a senior fellow in the Energy and National Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Prior to joining CSIS in 2010, uh, Ms. Nakano worked in the Office of Policy International Affairs in the U.S. Department of, Department of Energy, where she covered a host of energy economics and political issues in Asia. Finally, we're honored to have um, Mr. Michael Herberg here with us today. Uh, Mr. Herberg is a um, senior advisor and research director for the East 
uh, Energy Security Program at the National Bureau of Agent Research, NBR. He also served as the BP Foundation Senior Research Fellow for International Energy at the Pacific Council or International Policy, and a senior lecturer at the University of California, San Diego. Prior to joining the National Bureau of Agent Research, Mr. Herberg spent 20 years working in the oil industry, including serving as the Director for Global Energy and Economics at ARCO. Um, so Professor Tanaka is coming all the way from uh, Tokyo to come to Washington, D.C. to share his insight. And Mr. Herberg is coming from California. And also, we always have uh, glad to have um, Jane Nagano. So we are honored to be hosting this amazing group today. Thank you. So since we have this um, great group of panelists, I would like to um, start our discussion in um, raising three questions. Um, so again, um, today's event is titled Strategic Energy Cooperation, Middle East Relations, and the Future of Energy Security in Asia. And I'd like to share your views on maybe three issue areas. One, number one, Japan's strategic energy plan to diversify energy plans in terms of suppliers. And we can talk about United States and other um, region countries, too. Um, and number two, Japan's effort to reduce its energy dependence on the Middle, e on the Middle East, in, especially in light of um, the recent decision on Iranian oil sanctions waiver, as I briefly mentioned at my opening remarks. And number three, how um, geopolitical implication in, um, it would play out, and then your policy recommendations for Japan and then U.S.-Japan relations. And um, starting with Mr. Tanaka. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Dr. Oro, for your invitation. And I'm very delighted to be here and uh, to have them this, having this opportunity to express my views uh, regarding the uh, latest Japanese uh, strategic energy uh, program and also um, as well as its uh, relationship with the Middle East. Now let me just go through the usuals of um, telling you or also refreshing you in how uh, Japan's energy dependence in the, on the Middle East uh, looks like. To your left, you got the uh, share of the Middle East oil uh, in Japan's uh, energy procurement uh, from uh, starting from uh, physical year 2009, running up until last year, we see that uh, over 80%, sometimes uh, roughly as 90% of our oil uh, comes from the Middle East. So this is sort of an uh, issue that we've been uh, talking about for a very long time, ever since the first uh, oil shock in 90, back in 1973. The, uh, the uh, governments uh, from those days have always tried to reduce its dependence on the Middle East oil, but uh, so far we haven't been that much successful, as you can understand. And when it comes to LNG, liquefied natural gas, again, uh, the percentage is not that high, as you can see in the case of uh, oil. But the problem here is that uh, we don't have that sort of a strategic uh, storage uh, for uh, natural gas, and uh, liquid na liquefied natural gas, which makes it quite difficult once there is a sort of a shortage of supplies or a disruption of the supplies uh, coming out from the Middle East. Uh, back in uh, physical year 2014, the ratio was high as one-third of the entire procurement uh, from the Middle East. Uh, this was mainly because of the lack of the other resources, especially the nuclear reactors that had been shut down following the 2011 uh, disastrous incident in Fukushima. Uh, that later uh, brought on uh, the shutdowns of the rest of the uh, nuclear facilities as well. So uh, in 2016 and 17, uh, you see the reduction or the decrease of the uh, dependence of LNG toward, uh, from the Middle East, but still the figure is as high as 20%. Now the latest is that starting from this year, our physical year, meaning April 2019, uh, the reduce of the reduction or the decrease of the dependence on Middle East LNG is going to be further accomplished, hopefully, uh, simply because of our uh, new contract that we have with uh, UAE uh, is going to be less than it used to be. It's 90% less than what we used to uh, import. So that may have an impact 
on fiscal year 2019, but nonetheless, uh, we still import around uh, a certain percentage, less than 20, but significantly larger than uh, most of the other suppliers that we have through the ground. So that's how we are. Now, um, with this Middle East, now the latest uh, strategic energy uh, plan was uh, supposed to uh, diversify and also to relocate a lot of our uh, energy resources, as well as changing our uh, energy portfolio, just like uh, Dr. O had mentioned earlier. But uh, when it comes to the Middle East, uh, it is described and, uh, during, under the uh, current SCP as follows, that uh, we should reduce the heavy reliance, which, is, which we, we already know, that because of its uh, geo increasing the geopolitical risks in the Middle East, that's one thing. And we are still concerned about the political and the economic and social conditions that are shaping or reshaping the uh, countries in the Middle East that could have a negative effect on their ability to supply us in the future. We see them also as a party for cooperation, cooperation for economic development that should stabilize their society and eventually stabilize the entire region so that they will be less uh, to th worry about the uh, possible disruption from uh, the Middle East. But also, uh, we are looking into the cooperation field where uh, the energy conservation of those uh, energy producers would also provide a better chance uh, or an extended chance for us to import their energy. So uh, as you can understand, we are not totally talking about getting rid of the Middle East. We still are going to be heavily relying on the Middle East oil in particular. And uh, we so also see that there is a room for cooperation between us and the United States when it comes to the Middle East as part of the uh, entire globe. So we're not, uh, just to remind you is that we are trying to diversify. We are trying to decrease our in, uh, dependence on oil and from the Middle East uh, both ways. But still we see for the future uh, up until 2030 and even beyond that oil and the oil coming out from the Middle East will be a source that we have to rely on. The fourth part is that um, the energy generation, the power generation for Japan. Now, uh, when it comes to oil, it's not that important. It's not that significant uh, for us. But uh, the latest of this SCPs, uh, the column to the uh, far right, as you can see, still stipulates that we need to, uh, that we need to rely, I mean, in, by the year 2030, our intention is to reboot uh, most of our uh, nuclear facilities so that it could provide up until 20 to 22 percent of our power uh, requirement of electricity uh, generation. But uh, the reality is, uh, just to, uh, to the left, is what, what we see as of physical year 2016, two years ago. Is the latest is that we still uh, have a lot to go, a uh, long way to go when it comes to the diversification of the uh, energy uh, generation, power generation. And what you can see here is on the uh, extreme left, the column here, the pillar there, uh, stipulates is that th in those days, back in 2010, that style was more identical to what the uh, latest SEP stipulates, meaning that the diversification uh, is quite similar to what we are aiming for uh, for the year 2030. The only major difference here is that the uh, amount or the uh, segment of uh, re renewable energies would be much larger than it used to be. So, but basically it's much closer to what we had back in 2010, which would mean that would be prior to the nuclear disaster of Fukushima. And today the, the figure is totally different and we have what we're trying to do is to how to uh, move things forward into the direction that we want to see for the uh, another 11 years. And that is not a long time that is going to be left for us, but is the long way that we have to achieve. And that is the dif uh, difference that we see. And not surprisingly, when it comes to the primary energy consumption for Japan, it's basically about the uh, fossil fuels. Uh, still 76%, including LNG, oil, and coal, would be part of our primary uh, energy uh, consumption in year 2030. So that would also mean that we need a resource for oil, gas, and other 
uh, and also coal for, for that extent, which would not be that conducive for the uh, global environment, to, to tackle uh, global environment issues, but uh, our reality stands there. So then again, we have to ask ourselves, as the Japanese, uh, how are we going to achieve this while we are going to move away from the Middle East or to diversify our resources? Now, uh, one thing is that uh, we are capable now, thanks to the uh, shale movement here of the development on, on the uh, North American continent, that we are now capable of importing hydrocarbons from this piece of land. Uh, that is one way that we can find a new way to solve issues. But then again, still we are relying on the Middle East. And Middle East, again, is not a single country. It is a group of countries which are in conflict with each other. And there are a lot of issues that uh, they have to resolve by themselves. But there are external elements uh, that play into this that make things even difficult uh, for, the, uh, for a uh, reasonable solution. So I'll stop here to uh, the uh, other uh, distinguished panels to have their views. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Nion, uh, as well as for the uh, council for having me. And it's uh, uh, both an honor, but an also a very humbling experience to go after Professor Tanaka, who's uh, Japan's top uh, scholar on the Middle East. But uh, if I may add a couple uh, points about Japan's effort to move away from uh, uh, or reduce the reliance on both oil and, and, and Middle East uh, for the, in the share of uh, oil import dependence, it uh, has been a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge. Um, you know, the, in the aftermath of uh, oil embargoes in the 1970s, Japan actually uh, uh, made a progress in moving away from uh, or reducing the share of oil in its primary energy consumption from roughly 75% down to 40%. Um, but then, um, but still the reliance on import uh, remains very high, uh, as uh, Professor Tanaka said, over 90%. And then also in that share, the reliance on Middle East still remains high. So what are some of the ways that the Japanese try to address that uh, concern? Uh, one is, um, the uh, self uh, to reduce, uh, I'm sorry, to increase the share of self development ratio. Uh, it's defined as energy, uh, particularly hydrocarbons, uh, that Japan uh, consumes from uh, uh, projects that J Japanese companies have stakes in, uh, as opposed to self uh, uh, um, sufficiency ratio. I mean, that's the specific term that the Japanese um, energy. Um, uh, strategic policy documents used, but the self-development uh, ratio. Um, in 2016, the ratio was about 27 percent. Uh, by 2030, uh, the, uh, the plan is to increase that ratio to 40 percent. So, you know, going to, to upstream in uh, uh, countries uh, around the world, not just Middle East, but so to be able to um, have more of a uh, higher sense of security. Uh, as far as the uh, Japanese access to these resources go. Uh, uh, another important um, uh, initiative has been to do joint stockpiling with some of these energy rich countries from Middle East. For example, in 19, I'm sorry, 19, 2009, uh, Japan uh, started uh, joint stockpiling with uh, um, uh, UAE, um, uh, ad hoc of UAE, and in 2011, Japan started the similar joint stockpiling of uh, uh, crude with uh, Aramco from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so the idea is to have the physical crude in, uh, in Japan that could be used in the, the, um, to uh, counter uh, supply disruption. Um, and the third, and this is where I'd like to spend a little more time, uh, is the, this resource diplomacy that uh, the success of Japanese administrations have been putting a lot of efforts into. Uh, so Japan has maintained its own uh, energy diplomacy with all these countries from Middle East uh, who um, uh, themselves have been in various types of rivalries uh, among themselves. Um, and you know, for example, um, I've already mentioned this joint stockpiling uh, that the Jap uh, Japan has, but with 
um, the King Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, which is um, on which Japan is most dependent for uh, oil imports, uh, Japan has been trying to sort of uh, um, strengthen the economic ties through support uh, towards the Vision 2030. So there is something called uh, Japan uh, Saudi Arabia 2030 uh, that was uh, agreed on in 2017. Also from uh, with the UAE, which is the second uh, 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 top or leading uh, Middle Eastern uh, crude exporter to Japan, uh, Japan has again that stockpiling uh, initiative, joint stockpiling initiative, but there continues to be a lot of uh, efforts to strengthen that uh, more of an energy economic ties, not just uh, a very narrow oil uh, type of relationship. With Qatar, uh, Qatar of course is in um, uh, rivalry uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia and UAE um, at the moment, but um, Qatar's um, oil export to Japan is not that large, but of course, you know, when it comes to LNG, uh, Japan is still the largest importer of LNG in the world. Qatar is still uh, the top uh, exporter of LNG. So Japan places uh, significant uh, importance on uh, uh, relationship with Qatar. So as Qatar tries to, or uh, plans to expand its LNG export uh, capacity, I think Japan is actively seeking uh, ways to constructively engage or get involved. And then of, of course Iran. Um, Iran, uh, Japan and Iran have had long relationship and um, you know, the Japan relies on Iran only for 7% um, uh, give and take. And I'm not, this is not sort of up to date um, data. I guess this is uh, back in 2016 because there are all these things that are happening as you all know. But um, at the foreign ministry level, uh, uh, there continues to be um, uh, exchange and dialogue. But um, one of my, I guess, key the uh, thesis to share at, at this juncture um, is that so Japan does have this uh, pretty active resource diplomacy with Middle Eastern countries, but the latitude uh, that Japan's Middle East energy uh, diplomacy has is uh, quite constrained by Japan's formal security alliance with Japan uh, with the United States. Um, in the uh, Japan, uh, whether you know Japan, what what how Japan may respond to the the Trump administration's decision to seek. Uh, the zeroing out of the import um, the compliance back in the, the first time around, uh, in my view, was not really a big cons the big question, if you will. Um, unlike you know the discussions with uh, Beijing or New Delhi when it came to Tokyo, I don't think there was um, a, a sort of a, a big way that uh, Japanese um, actions may. Uh, depart from the way that the, the, the U.S. government was seeking uh, uh, um, uh, to, un, uh, to uh, roll out uh, the uh, sanctions matter, a uh, reimposition re of sanction. Also, as Adegan, uh, uh, the Japanese interest in uh, developing uh, Iran's Azadegan field uh, back 15, 20 years ago, um, the Japanese decision to uh, basically um, uh, relinquish its stake, uh, uh, you know, was I think considered in the context of U.S.-Japan uh, security alliance, uh, directly or indirectly. But it was always in the context of this bigger uh, 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 sort of a consideration. Um, Quickly, I think there are two complicating, potentially complicating, but then uh, factors, um, it's two factors that complicate this formula that are underappreciated uh, in Washington and Tokyo that I wanted to share with you, obviously in my view, but. Mm. Uh, to the Japanese side, I think it's, um, it's somewhat, of, somewhat confusing to see how the administration and the US Congress may not completely agree on um, how the U.S. feels about the relationship with Saudi Arabia, to be honest with you. Um, I think, um, um, you know, uh, the general uh, Japanese public tend to be um, uh, not as aware of um, issues um, uh, or the, the, the sentiment in the U.S. Congress uh, about, you know, whether, you know, um, the, uh, um, the uh, 
uh, sorry, the JASTA, uh, which is the Justice Against uh, Sponsors of Terrorism, that was uh, enacted in 2016. Um, how the U.S. public in general uh, do remember uh, the, uh, the the way that the 9/11 uh, happened, and, and uh, um, many of these um, uh, terrorists were, uh, you know, came from Saudi Arabia, and, and that sort of factor is, com uh, is often uh, underappreciated in, in Japanese politics or Jap maybe in Japan. Also, uh, it's quite a surprise to some of the folks in Japan or perhaps Asia that there is continued introduction of NOPEC legislation, uh, um, uh, which is the uh, uh, legislation to, uh, to basically, you know, um, uh, uh, about going after the, the, uh, the anti uh, I'm sorry, antitrust or the car cartel element of uh, what the OPEC does. And these things tend to be, I think, uh, overlooked. And so I think that's something, um, uh, um, I guess that's you know, underappreciated. On the, the US side, I think more importantly, is that a lot of things that the Japan um, do, uh, not all, and certainly there are so many uh, different factors, but. China is definitely part of the consideration how sometimes Japan tries to uh, maintain its uh, energy diplomatic relationships uh, with these uh, important uh, hydrocarbon states in the Middle East. Um, in, you know, as China became uh, one of the largest, or if not the largest, um, sort of um, uh, market mover and shaper, uh, sh shaker and mover in, in the global energy markets, um, certainly, uh, Chinese tie with key energy uh, exporters in the Middle East have expanded. Uh, currently, uh, China is the biggest customer of uh, Saudi crude. Also with uh, UAE, uh, to UAE, I think China is the, by far the largest bilateral trade partner, trading partner. So, um, and you know, the, um, the, uh, these bilateral relationships that the China has and, and China is committed to expanding for its energy security, but perhaps for foreign policy and national security considerations are something that do get factored in as Japan looks to um, uh, maintain its relationship with all these key Middle Eastern countries. Um, and I guess, so the rise of the United States as a global, um, uh, oil, gas, but particularly in this context, oil supplier is uh, a welcoming uh, development to Japan, I would say, uh, as it has diversified a pool of suppliers, but then also trading routes and et cetera. But to the extent that that newfound wealth may have emboldened uh, the, the U.S. approach to Middle East and, and uh, whether uh, intentionally or not, uh, perhaps uh, starting to destabilize the region is a huge concern to Japan as its reliance on, uh, on oil for the primary energy and then also on the Middle East for the share of oil imports um, will continue to, continue to be the reality. So that's sort of my thesis for now. And then I'll, uh, I'll just show you. Thank you very much. Michael? Uh, thank you, Mion. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I don't, I don't think I've ever spoken at the Atlantic Council over all these years. Uh, so it's great to be here, a truly distinguished uh, panel here. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, we, we've been, we at NBR, we worked on this, uh, some of these issues several years ago, back in 2014, 2015. We ran a, a, a study where we were looking at some of these key uh, issues uh, and trying to understand where Asia's energy security architecture needed to go in the future based upon some basic fundamentals. One, as we're seeing here, Japan, South Korea, China uh, are heavily dependent on Middle East oil supplies, will remain heavily dependent on Middle East oil supplies no matter how much U.S. oil exports happen. Um, it's just that's where the oil is and be very hard to, to change that. Second, uh, the U.S. is disengaging or changing its posture towards the Middle East. Now we can debate that, of course, how, how to describe that. But clearly the U.S. 
Pax Americana in the Middle East, what we, you know, the efforts to stabilize uh, the region, two Iraq wars, uh, you know, you go back all the way to the Iran-Iraq war and the tanker wars. Our efforts to, to stabilize the region we are just no longer willing to put boots on the ground and spend blood and treasure on a major scale that we used to in the past. Um, we can see that in a whole set of ways or debate it. But now, those two factors, the US was reducing its posture and willingness to work stabilizing, especially the Gulf combined with continued dependence on the Middle East. Uh, we felt left Japan and, and the rest of China, Asia's oil importers in an increasingly pr difficult situation where they had depended on U.S. efforts to stabilize the region, U.S. efforts to maintain the security of the sea lanes from the Persian Gulf to Asia. Those two pieces are absolutely critical to Asia's energy security and will remain that way. So how do you, how do you address this? How do you shape, how, how do you think about the future for Japan and Asia in terms of energy security? Uh, our, our arguments, we held meetings in Washington, we held meetings in Tokyo, and we held meetings in Beijing to, to address the same set of issues. And it was a really interesting set of different views about this. Uh, but but our, our, our conclusions were that uh, China is going to be too big a piece of the puzzle in energy security in Asia in the future to just try to ignore them. Uh, they get 30% of their total oil supplies now from the Middle East and that continues to rise, 65% oil import dependence. Uh, their posture in the Middle East is gradually growing they're being dragged into the region by their energy interests uh, and economic interests as much as they don't want to be. Uh, I don't think you can argue China's uh, aggressively pursued its interest in the Gulf. It's being pulled. Uh, it's had a very pretty light touch so far. Uh, but you can see by setting up a, a military operation in Djibouti uh, and a whole set of other things, uh, they're being pulled into the region. So how do you square the circle? How do you try to shape this into something for the future if you're Japan and the US? Uh, something that, that will increase the region's energy security with this Middle East dependence. Uh, and we, we, we felt, you know, you, you first you need to think collaboratively, including China, uh, in, in the sense that the whole region faces the exact same energy security challenge of dependence on Middle East oil, uh, and to some extent LNG, but I think LNG is a much less acute, acute problem. Uh, you can't ignore China, so our argument was you need to think about a new energy security architecture in, in, in Asia and the middle, towards the Middle East that is collaborative. Uh, th where you're trying to work together with common interests and stability in the Middle East, in security of those sea lanes. Uh, China and the rest of Asia all have essentially mutual interests. Uh, now we know that the geopolitical overlay obviously is becoming increasingly difficult to imagine how to do that. We did this work in 2014 and published it in 2015. Uh, things didn't look quite so there wasn't quite so much friction in the system uh, as we have now today under the Trump administration, the increasing confrontation with China uh, across a multitude of fronts. Uh, and what I would argue is, is Trump's administration's very confrontational, uh, uh, divisive approach to the Middle East, you know, hammering on Iran, doubling down on the Saudi alliance, uh, ignoring allies that could help us with these things. Uh, so, but what we argued, and I still think it's valid, is the region needs to develop a regional energy security collaboration mechanism. Back in 2006, under the Bush administration, uh, uh, Tom Christensen 
was running the Asia desk at, at State, and they put together a five-country energy ministerial meeting, focused exactly, including China, Japan, South Korea, India, and the U.S. <laughs> and and uh, they were looking exactly at this kind of issue. How do we collaborate on something where we have such profound common interests? Uh, it was never followed up on, really. It had one meeting, maybe a second one that was kind of moribund. Uh, and frankly, a lot of the lack of dynamism was from the U.S. side. Just simply lost interest, uh, distracted by other things. But I would argue that that's a model that you could think about where you can talk about energy security and try to try to shape that by, while cordoning it off a bit from the, the greater strategic competition that's going on. Um, so that, that was our kind of main sense of things. How, how does the region work towards uh, collaboration and what that would mean? For example, if you have an oil disruption, serious, serious oil disruption, uh, Asia still is completely unprepared uh, for crude oil sharing, products market sharing. I mean, in the products market are going to be chaotic. Oil, gas, diesel supplies, other things are going to be absolutely chaotic. Uh, as you take the crude shortage disruption and run it down through, downstream through the system to the refining, Asia has not a, any, any idea about how to manage something like that. Uh, we also have no idea of how to manage an LNG problem because even though it's lower dependence on LNG from the Middle East, if that supply were disrupted, it's a much more rigid, lumpy market. It's not as flexible in any way like oil markets. Yes, it's becoming much more flexible, but even so, replacing, uh, you know, 60 million tons of, of uh, LNG be extremely difficult thing to do if you had uh, a problem with Qatar. So those kinds of issues need to be cordoned off in a sense and addressed collaboratively, and it has to include China. Otherwise, I think you end up with something like the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, which is now seen largely as a response to the Belt and Road Initiative as a Western US-led um, uh, process. So I mean, we can, and we can all debate if that's the right description of that. Uh, but I think what's happening now is diverging. You're getting the Br Belt and Road Initiative, you're getting free and open in the Pacific. Uh, rather than a collaborative process, and I think each is pursuing their own energy agenda in that. Uh, LNG, obviously, a key part of the free and open Indo-Pacific. We're going to have a meeting all day next week at NBR out advertisement on Wednesday <laughs> uh, looking at LNG, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. You know, uh, is there meat on the bone there, and, and is that going to be effective? Uh, so we would argue you need a mutually a collaborative process. How you get there in, in the current environment with the Trump administration in particular uh, I think is a difficult, heavy lift. But otherwise, without it, Japan will continue to depend on Middle East oil, continue to have to uh, deal with uncertain supplies. You've got a Middle East that I would argue is becoming more and more dangerous, more and more violent, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia and Iran. When you have armed drones flying over from, from the Houthis in Yemen, you know, obviously, uh, supported by the Iranians, flying over Saudi oil facilities and pipelines, that's a new, that's a new dimension of things that we haven't seen before. Uh, very worrisome from my perspective, but we're headed, I think, in the wrong direction in terms of more violence that will increasingly likely affect oil uh, production and supplies. You can very easily imagine that becoming a real target, uh, a point of leverage. Uh, so I think we need to double down on an effort to develop a collaborative regional energy security architecture rather than the current kind of every country for themselves approach that Japan is vulnerable to. And with, with that, I'll stop and 
but thank being you very much all and um, sharing your inside experience wisdom and I learned so much and I hope also um, our audience um, also um, learn a lot and I hope I, I'm I, I'm sure that we have a lot of questions from the floor, but then before we open up the floor, I would like to um, come back to each of you and then have question. So first um, to Mr. Tanaka, and um, so the Medi, the Minister of Energy, Trade and Industry, he mentioned uh, recently that the loss of Iran import will not affect Japan's energy security at a strategic level. And um, but then we also at the same time hear from the industry and industry experts that, um, but still, and as you mentioned, the alternative supplies to Iranian oil for Japan are still likely come mainly from the Middle East and given the existing supply chain. And then the U.S. crude oil um, is lighter than Iranian crude, so meaning that alternative imports are not expected to come from the United States. And um, so where does this U.S. oil could fit into, and then we, you can also you can also include the U.S. LNG, and and um, at, so on the other hand, I also like to um, just bring up that um, on the other hand, the IEA they announced recently also that the world will require very little extra oil from OPEC this year, as U.S. output will offset the falling export from Iran and Venezuela. So hearing this um, interesting. Um, different analysis and then so how does U.S. oil would fit into this equation and would like to hear from your expertise. Thank you. Um. Oh, and then and then I'm sorry and then and then you mentioned that you um, still think that there's areas of uh, potential U.S.-Japan collaboration mm -hmm. and then Japan is really trying to um, diversify its portfolio and then reducing its dependence on the Middle East but then uh, it has to be realistic in the strategic energy plan, so I'd like to hear from you. Right, well, thank you for the question. Um, the role of Iranian oil had reduced significantly throughout the 2000s. It didn't start yesterday or today. Uh, we gradually were kept under a strong, say, uh, pressure from uh, Washington, and uh, we started to reduce our dependence on Iranian oil as early as the uh, mid-2000s. At one point, we had imported like 17 percent of our oil uh, from Iran. That came down to nine, eight, seven, mm -hmm. six, and you can imagine now it's going to be zero for year uh, 2019 or beyond mm -hmm. uh, if this condition continues. Mm -hmm. So uh, this didn't happen overnight. So we were well prepared. But then, w what kind of a role, or what kind of a role that U.S. oil or shale oil could have in our portfolio? is a totally different uh, question or equation. Um, as you mentioned, uh, U.S. Uh, oil is light, and our uh, refinery, uh, cap refinery capacities are actually not capable of handling this in a proper way. So it would not be cost effective. It would rather, uh, we would rather import gas or gas oil uh, as an oil product uh, from the United States rather than actually having crude on our own. That is the likeliness. But then again, um, the, the entire amount of oil imports uh, from the Japanese community, uh, the uh, economy is uh, on its decrease, initially because of the um, reliance on oil as a means of transportation. It still remains to be the mm -hmm. capital and uh, signifi most significant mm -hmm. uh, source for the transportation fuel. But uh, with the hybrids and EVs coming into the uh, market, and the more likeliness is that it's going to continue and even expand, uh, the amount of oil that are, we are picking up uh, from the external markets are on its uh, decrease. So uh, the role of, first of all, Iranian oil, if tomorrow the sanctions are lifted, mm -hmm. it's unlikely that it's going to regain its prior position uh, like it had in the early 2000s. And again, the role of U.S. oil products, again, would be a source of relief for us as a backup, but it would still not be the chief uh, source that we are going to rely upon. So that's one thing. The U.S. Um, uh, Japan, uh, Japan cooperation, yes, uh, I've mentioned that. But when it comes to the Middle East, I think there is a sort of uh, issue that we have to resolve first. 
we, Tokyo and Washington, I believe, we share a lot in common. Mm -hmm. And uh, because a lot has to say, a lot has to do with the security uh, conditions in Tokyo, we rely on the uh, United States. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is likely that we would have to eventually follow the line of the United States in a lot of areas uh, of, its, of our foreign policy issues. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the Middle East, this is the location I believe that it has its divergence of views, mm -hmm. which is quite obvious. Mm -hmm. Iran is one thing, and also it may not uh, be related to our energy portfolio, but our, uh, uh, but our policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. With the Trump administration cutting off its aid towards the Palestinians, we, Japan, continue to support them, knowing that because of the same reason that we are not trying to desert the Iranians. Maybe on the oil factor, maybe, but not diplomatically. Simply because that we consider that deserting them or isolating them would do no good for the entire region, eventually would lead to a disastrous uh, condition in the entire Persian Gulf that would hamper a lot of the oil imports that we rely on and also the LNG imports from a country like Qatar. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I would have to say that Middle East, on the Middle East, we need to agree to disagree, which is still not happening in the way that we, uh, we mm -hmm. expect to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jane and Michael, do you have any reactions to Mr. Tanaka? What, what would you like to add? Any comments? I think, I think it's important that the that mm. diversion that you're talking about, about mm. Mm. A U.S. policy and mm. Japanese approach to, mm. to the Middle East. Mm. And I th it's, it's been a problem for, for a long time, mm. but it's obviously an, a, a really acute <laughs> issue under this current administration. Mm. Uh, and it's, I, th I think it puts Japan in an extremely difficult position. Uh, and I, you, I, you can see the Abe administration trying to manage that relationship as well as they can. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and it's, I think one of the reasons it's so difficult to get together a collaborative approach mm -hmm. to stability in the, in the Gulf, because U.S. policy is really amped up mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I don't, I don't think there's a great deal of support mm -hmm. uh, from any of our allies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, so, Jane, um, it was really interesting, and and um, and also thank you for sharing. So you said that basically U.S. Um, and Japan Middle Eastern energy relations, um, not energy, but overall economic security relations, and then how it is constrained by the decisions on the U.S. government, and then also um, um, the confusing messages probably both sides and the U.S. Congress. So I. Th that was really interesting to me. And then um, you um, briefly mentioned the China factor, and then I'd like to hear more on that. And probably, um, so right now, this energy equation is also very, um, it's getting more complicated um, given the current US-China tensions. And then um, China continues to import Iranian fuel and then tariff on LNG, but then not on oil. So maybe it's uh, too too many uh, you know <laughs> too complex cities. But then but then you um, your your brief statement on the China factor. If you could elaborate more on that, that would be great. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, I think um, the stable Middle East serves both Japanese and Chinese interests. So in many ways, it's it's not necessarily zero sum. I think where things get um, uh, somewhat competitive in uh, thinking is, you know, for, you know, the things like, um, you know, under the, the current, you know, sanctions regime, you know, the Japanese are concerned that they might miss out the chance to uh, develop, uh, you know, for example, Iranian oil fields, um, uh, the same way, uh, you know, uh, they had to sort of give up uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, and also, you know, the eventual uh, the market potential in many of these countries that may have very contentious relationship with uh, with the U.S. But uh, as market, but then also, you know, uh, um, um, so I, I think that's where um, 
I would expect uh, continued sort of a rivalry or the, the in, in thinking. But in many ways, I think the, as um, uh, Mike mentioned, you know, both Japan and, and China will benefit from uh, stable um, uh, regional um, environment and also uh, the you know, U.S. being part of the discussion would be very helpful. I think um, in many ways uh, some of the, the recent you know, U.S. Um, policy developments uh, are, um, um, give some you know, folks a, a bit of pause as to you know, uh, is the United States shifting away from its long-time commitment to uh, supporting the norms and principles that enhance uh, the international energy um, uh, sort of architecture, uh, the transparency and competitiveness, uh, now that the U.S. has greater uh, hydrocarbon wealth. That's where I think perhaps Japan and China could take greater leadership in re-engaging the U.S. and, and, and um, you know, whether it's the, you know, the under the five uh, country um, formula or could be, you know, could include uh, India and, and, and Korea and others as well. But I think, um, you know, it, since there is confusion, even if if it were not the intent of the, the U.S. administration, there I think there is a greater confusion among a lot of allies. I think it probably the time is ripe to have that sort of discussion uh, going. Uh, on the U.S.-China piece, uh, it is, um, Obviously, you know, about two weeks ago, I thought you know we're seeing the, the end to this uh, trade war, uh, if you will. And but of course, you know, we're in sort of a, the next phase, um, and I'm not sure exactly how long that this this current phase may last. But it's interesting to see how um, the LNG is the subject of retaliatory tariff uh, hike, but then uh, oil isn't or the crude um, isn't uh, uh, to date, and. I think it speaks to a lot of you know, uh, qualitative differences or characteristics uh, that Mike has already alluded to. You know, the global oil market is a lot more fluid, dynamic, and you know, it's much more mature uh, market versus you know, LNG is uh, much clunkier. Uh, and I think the Chinese probably realize that um, you know, L having uh, increasing the tariff rates on LNG imports from the U.S. may actually um, uh, matter to the U.S. Uh, energy sector, whereas, you know, on the crude, you know, uh, you know there are still a lot of outlets. Uh, there are many ways to, uh, for the U.S. crude to get to other uh, markets. But then also, I think I would wonder to what extent um, that uh, the Chinese government may be concerned that by imposing uh, tariffs on U.S. crude may undermine some of the Chinese importing companies rationale for having the uh, uh, waiver applications, uh, even though the you know, waiver has been, uh, you know, uh, was not extended uh, the second time around, but um, one could, one, you know, someone within the administration could argue, well, you know, if you can afford more expensive crude from the U.S., um, or if you, you know, um, how do I say it? So, the, uh, you know, if, um, you know, the, the Chinese companies, uh, you know, may, may um, so if, you know, if the Chinese company importers could afford um, uh, more, even a more expensive uh, crude from the U.S., then, and then perhaps you should be really, uh, you shouldn't be needing uh, um, uh, the waiver applications to be approved. Um, so I think there's a bit of that sort of calculation as well. I, 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 would, uh, I wonder, I mean, obviously, I'm not inside the administration, but I think there are a lot of different uh, um, uh, factors that go into that, uh, the, the, how the energy, um, uh, uh, different energy commodities um, are treated differently in the U.S.-China uh, trade piece. Thank you. Tanaka-san and Michael, would you like to add on China? Any comments on China? Yes, please. Well, um, well, thank you, Jane, for your insights. And actually, I think that uh, with, the, with regards to Iran that you mentioned earlier, uh, eventually who got the uh, contracts when the Japanese uh, withdrew was the Chinese. But then again, the Chinese were not able to proceed further again because firstly, with the uh, U.S. sanctions that extended uh, to their activities as well. So uh, they're also vulnerable. 
we, are, we definitely are vulnerable, but also the Chinese are sometimes vulnerable, as e are equally as vulnerable as we are. So, um, but still, I, I need to think of this uh, rationale that has been discussed even in the earlier 2000s and even of today, is that uh, if we, I mean, if the United States uh, pr exerts its maximum so-called pressure against Iran or the third parties uh, not to deal with Iran, and eventually who are going to be left is going to be the question. Uh, if it's going to be nobody, then it could be the, the, the actual minute, uh, maximum pressure that the Trump administration might have been talking about. But if there are others who will be backfilling the absence, in the absence of the Westerners or the countries like Japan or Korea or others, then uh, those are maybe the, uh, become the winners of taking uh, whatever's left. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not considering that uh, the maximum pressure issue is going to be the actual solution to whatever the uh, Trump administration is aiming for. Michael? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard, to, hard to know what the Trump administration end game in Iran is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know that, <laughs> maybe they don't know that. <laughs> and the, these are all my personal views. There's no institutional uh, <laughs> responsibility for my views. But I, I think uh, it's hard to know what that end game is. Mm -hmm. And so what are the oil implications mm -hmm. uh, if ultimately regime changes is really what the game is? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then, uh, you know, we're, we're in for, you know, more, more instability and risk to, to oil supplies mm -hmm. in the Gulf because mm -hmm. the regime won't go quietly, <laughs> to put it, put it mildly. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that's a, you know, cr this is creating kind of a dead end f in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see a good, good way out of this mm -hmm. and what the, what the administration's strategy really is. Mm -hmm. okay. um, if I may, I'd like to come back to you. Um, and so you mentioned, so the, the five, country ministerial level and then there was never follow up and then mainly because of the, the lack of interest from the US side. And so the that initiative is still very relevant within your report since it was um, written three, four years ago and then the situation and environment has been a little bit changed and then I think US could have a different set of a calculation and then interest. So how could you share your views and your well, I, insight? I can only kind of say, um, I think the administration is going in a direction where, the, where a five country salute or effort is more difficult. Uh, obviously we're not, this administration is disinclined towards multilateral things that it feels constrains American uh, freedom of, of uh, movement. but. I think we do have some common ground to build on. I think we were searching for this when we were doing this. Uh, how do we think about common ground and, and with the Chinese and Japanese and U.S.? Uh, look at the uh, anti-piracy efforts in the, in the Gulf of Oman, I guess it is. Uh, the Chinese have been very active uh, since very early on. Uh, I've, I've, uh, we had a somebody talk in our Tokyo, in our Beijing meeting, a Japanese, describing how ch Chinese sh uh, ships had been e escorting Japanese uh, ships uh, as part of what it was doing. Uh, and it, there were numbers were in the hundreds of the, of the escorts that had occurred, Chinese escorting Japanese ships. That goes kind of against the way we think about this. Uh, and so I think the Chinese work in parallel with the allies on the uh, anti-piracy effort. It's not as integrated as part, as I understand it. But they have been collaborative in this approach to sea lanes and the security of sea lanes out in that region. And part of the reason they argue they've established the Djibouti base is to be able to service uh, this roughly three ship contingent that they constantly keep out in the Gulf, uh, largely escorting Chinese vessels, but also others. Uh, so I think th we have, I and the other one I, case, and I could be corrected here, was that as uh, 
uh, we were negotiating the five uh, plus P P5 nuclear arrangement, that near the end, the Chinese were constructive in helping c encourage Iran to come along to sign the deal uh, with promises, we'll buy Iranian oil, we'll bring massive amounts of investment uh, to Iran. If you sign on, we'll be able to do that. Uh, and that's, in a sense, working in parallel with U.S. and other efforts to forge that agreement. Uh, so I think there are, there, there are areas where you can see Chinese understand our common interests, uh, that we have a common interest at the time in avoiding a real true Iranian confrontation. <laughs> We're kind of headed back again in that, in that direction. Uh, so think of a Shangri-La dialogue, confidence building process, where the five or six key parties sit down uh, every six months to talk about energy security, to talk about sea lane security, talk about common approaches to uh, you know, making sure that oil flows from the Gulf and some of the political efforts to try to do that. Uh, I think there's, there's really, there, there are some uh, models for, for moving forward on that. It, that can be overwhelmed by geopolitics and by you know, a, a very big shift in US policy. Maybe it's just simply being overwhelmed by the, the geopolitical shift going on here. I grant, I grant that, mm -hmm. but I think there is common ground there possibly if we, mm -hmm. if we really work to uh, develop it. Thank you. Any comments? Um, I, um, do you have any final comment before I open up the floor for Q&A? Okay, so we would like to open the floor for questions. Any, please gentlemen in the back. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Nakano. Uh, you, you could, you, could you please identify yourself? Yes, I'm Leon Weintraub. I'm a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Ms. Nakano. You mentioned the joint stockpiles. I wonder if you could expand upon that a little bit in four areas. Number one, uh, who owns them, where are they, who can access them, and what is the incentive for the Saudis and other Middle Eastern countries to participate in them? Um, so thanks for the question. Um, so the, the, uh, the one with the uh, UAE is in Kagoshima, uh, the western part of Japan. The one with uh, uh, Aramco is in Okinawa. And I believe they are, so they, they're storing their crude in a Japanese facility and managed by Jogamet, but I might actually have to get back. To, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a public information. It's just not, you know, it's not on their top website, you know, like when you visit the Japanese government website. But um, if you're interested in uh, details, uh, I'd be happy to. But so if there's disruption, my understanding is that the Japanese have the first right to uh, access it to meet its uh, uh, this disruption concern. But they could also the Saudis and um, in in uh, in terms the regarding the the facility in Okinawa and then UAE regarding the facility in Kagoshima, they can also sell it. Or they, they can they can release it to other buyers, but let me get back. But I think it's the the idea is the interest is for the Japanese side is to have the the physical crude um, uh, s store there and then be um, the sort of buffer uh, if there is supply disruption until further shipments arrive. For the the Saudis and uh, the UAE. Um, you know the proximity to the the the, um, the to um, sort of the non OECD Asia, but then also have the the co a commodity there that could be um, deployed quickly uh, when there is additional uh, needs that arise. That's my understanding. Uh, that I could be. Um, oh, yeah. I thought there was someone from Japanese government official to correct me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Hello. Um, I'm uh, Dennis McGinn, a retired Navy uh, Admiral. Uh, I'm on uh, several boards, Electric Power Research Institute, Rocky Mountain Institute, and the Center for Climate Security. I think it'd be helpful to broaden the uh, context of an energy security discussion like this 
and extend the time frame. By broadening the, uh, the context, I mean energy security, economic security, and environmental security are all inextricably linked. And anything you really consider seriously in any one of those areas is going to have an effect on the others. We also need to extend the time frame. Uh, think about this happy thought. In two years, there could be a new administration. <laughs> uh, but in any case, it could be longer than that. But thinking uh, out 10 years uh, and thinking about that interrelationship between energy security, uh, environmental security, and economic security, I think Japan has some tremendous opportunities for leadership. One, uh, tremendous electronics uh, industry and expertise, R&D, et cetera, and tremendous expertise in uh, transportation, automobiles, for example. I see a trend of electrification that is going on throughout the world. It's j we're on the, on the cusp of really big advances. And I think that uh, if you think about combining things like energy efficiency uh, in the industrial, commercial, residential, uh, context, if you think about uh, the uh, resurgence potential for Japanese nuclear uh, power uh, production, and if you think about the downside of not doing anything about uh, uh, environmental security, i.e., uh, encouraging or permitting the proliferation of coal fired power plants throughout Asia. Uh, you think about what that does to the supply chain for that very same Japanese electronics industry and uh, automobile industry throughout Southeast Asia and South Asia, and the effects that climate change is going to have uh, in the future increasingly on disrupting those supply chains because of the tremendous uh, social and economic uh, and, and literally human, uh, human strife that will, uh, will cause. So, Broaden the context about uh, energy security, and I think that, uh, and you focus on what Japan can do with its assets as a leader uh, of in the world, global leader in the world, that would produce much better economic growth and quality of life, not just in Japan, but for, for others as well. Okay, thank you for sharing your comment. Any more questions? Couldn't agree with you more, uh, and I think we're just focused on a sh much shorter time frame. And oil is a peculiar problem. It's not really a power generation fuel, which is where the best progress in all this is occurring. Uh, it's the transportation uh, uh, constraint. And also petrochemicals, the largest part of the growth in oil consumption over the next 20 years will not be from transportation, but will be from petrochemical feedstocks. Uh, and so uh, even if you tame a lot of the transportation demand, you're still left with quite a bit of growth in other parts of the oil chain. Uh, but I think long run, you're absolutely no question, um, you know, and, and we can hope personally that we'll have an administration somewhere soon that's sense it, you know, that understands and is, responds to it. If I may add sure. um, quickly, um, mm. uh, to my knowledge, uh, there, um, it's not just Japanese, but I think Jap Japanese um, institutions are among those that are um, starting to be more engaged with different uh, Middle Eastern economies looking at uh, energy efficiency technologies and, and such, and to some extent um, that's the type of engagement uh, less likely to be politicized. So uh, I, I think uh, it has been going on, and as you uh, framed it correctly, I think there, you know, there's only sort of a potential and also upside to, to uh, you know, expand. So thanks for your comment. Thank you. Sure, please. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your confidence in our uh, technology and economy. Uh, I myself have, some, uh, have to be, happen to be sometimes pessimistic about our own future. So I'm really relieved to hear an American view on this. And I, um, one thing, just like Jane just mentioned, uh, we are encouraging uh, oil producers in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, uh, 
to uh, convert their uh, oil or natural gas to Qatar as well. Natural gas, uh, not by using them directly, but uh, converting them to hydrogen so that uh, the carbon uh, factor would be contained at the very uh, level, uh, at the very uh, moment of production, uh, production rather than uh, its uh, consumption. So that eventually uh, hydrogen would become sort of a medium for energy, not as a uh, the petroleum or natural gas as its own. So maybe that would be some sort of an area of uh, uh, in the area of cooperation that we may uh, look uh, look further into. Future. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm Catherine Ghani. I'm a market analyst with Capital Alpha Partners. And my question's directed specifically to Jane, but I'd be happy if either of the gentlemen on stage would answer as well. I'm wondering, um, you spoke about Abe's uh, policy of energy diplomacy. How would the US feel about Japan using energy diplomacy with a US adversary, for example, Iran or Russia? So Iran, um, actually, uh, when it comes to um, the area where there's um, much less uh, discussion uh, within Washington about Japan's constraint is like Russia. I'm glad that you brought Russia, but I try not to talk about it as much because you know I'm here to talk about Middle East today. But that's also where I think uh, the difference between how the, the Congress sees the U.S. Uh, relationship and stakes vis-a-vis -vis Kremlin um, and how the White House looks at it and then also there is fairly like uh, um, developed uh, bipartisan consensus on the hill about um, Russia that tends to be uh, 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 less appreciated in in Japan um, but so they, but your question is m much more about you know how um, the, we should or the US should think about it um, you know I think there are so many different um, uh, concerns that go into it, but I think in many ways, I, I think that um, uh, there is, compared to, uh, to before, I think there's greater understanding of uh, the environment in which that the Japan has been undertaking its resource diplomacy um, in that, you know, it's not just uh, I mean, so there's the, as uh, Professor Tanaka said, there, you know, there's a concern about uh, the stability of the region itself, but then, you know, it's the, what the China may do or, you know, in the event that, you know, uh, U.S. policy um, does not yield the type of, uh, the, the whatever outcome that it's, it's aiming to deliver on, but if there are other players that are willing to put money in, then what does that mean? I mean, uh, unless you are so certain that you can close the loophole, there are other players that could go. And then so that's sort of the Iran uh, 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 situation. When it comes to Russia, I wouldn't say it's, uh, the situation is identical, but you know, R Russia is Japan's neighbor um, uh, as much as China is Japan's neighbor. So the way that we look at Russia is often through more of a uh, Eurasian or the, the Europe Russia context as opposed to perhaps Russia's eastern side of the Pacific Coast side of um, um, uh, diplomacy. Um, so um, I think there has been a uh, um, you know, degree of uh, uh, appreciation uh, even within Washington, although I, I'm not sure how uh, that translates from administration to administration or specific, you know, teams or, or, or personalities, but um, I think that's really the reality. And, and to some extent, I think the, you know, we also need to figure out what, what we, you know, would it be, would it serve our own interest in sort of forcing all our allies to pick a side, if you will. And, and Japan, and, and, but even in this circumstance, Japan is not necessarily picking Iran over US or Russia over, I mean, because there's this very strong uh, security alliance, and that's really the foundation of uh, their their diplomacy. But I think on you know some of these uh, what, you know economic security matters and, and such, uh, there is strategic um, 
uh, that there's something to be said about having more of a, um, uh, uh, um, more of a uh, strategic uh, uh, latitude or the, the you know, flexibility uh, that could actually serve the U.S. interest as much as Japan's interest in U.S.-Japan alliance. Thanks. Thank you. Would you like to comment? Yes, Please. Yeah. Um, if you talk about Russia, start talking about Russia, I think it's more, uh, let's say, similar to the U.S.-Russian, uh, what U.S.-Russian relationship is going to affect uh, Tokyo's diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Moscow is going to be uh, more likely uh, the outcome with the U.S.-Iranian relationship or non-relationship that is going to affect our diplomacy with, uh, Iran with the Iranians. Whereas when you look at China, if there's a constraint, if there's a problem between Washington and Beijing, usually the, uh, usually the Chinese are often, uh, say, uh, the part to uh, become war uh, warming up to Tokyo. So there, there's a difference here. Uh, Russia, Iran, when the United States have difficulties with them, our relationship with them are also be, uh, be uh, troublesome. Whereas uh, with China, uh, the situation is quite different. Uh, so I'm not uh, intentionally bringing China into the equation here, but uh, there are certain cases when the difficulty uh, with a, a third country, uh, third government with, uh, from uh, the view of Washington is going to cause us a problem, but sometimes it works in our favor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Hello, Shiana Gunasekara. I'm with the Department of Energy. Um, we just to talk, touch on the topic of hydrogen. Um, what are some of the other emerging technologies that Japan might be interested in as a way to divert um, its in, its reliance on the Middle East and oil, um, perhaps in the renewable energy space? Um, maybe that's an opportunity for U.S. and Japan um, collaboration. Um, that's one question. The second question, um, open to the panel. Um, we've seen some uh, cooperation with Japan and India on um, increasing flexibility in the Asian LNG market. Uh, we've seen uh, increased infrastructure, um, LNG import uh, projects, um, re reduced um, destination clause uh, rigid rigidity, rigidity in uh, contracts. Um, and we've seen, we're starting to see more collaboration with India and China in terms of um, their new joint working group on oil and gas. And this is not including the U.S. at all. So are we seeing a, a new trend of this regional uh, energy sec um, security cooperation that Mr. Herberg mentioned? Um, is this uh, the first step to, you know, moving forward in that direction, having more, perhaps in the LNG space, having more uh, flexibility, more dynamism in that area? Um, just without the U.S. Is this, um, are we seeing enough movement there or is this just uh, maybe a quick spark and we'll see it fall flat soon? Okay, well thank you for the question. Um, with the Middle East uh, oil producers or gas producers, we're pr uh, trying to promote hydrogen as I said earlier. But apart from that, the other uh, main issue that we're talking with them and in collaboration with them is the energy cons uh, conservation. So if they consume less energy, that will be in their benefit uh, for their uh, ability to export more. But that means that uh, we are still, we will still be dependent on their energy resource. And the point is that it has two factors. One is that it's going to be more, say, conducive for the uh, environmental uh, considerations. And uh, the second is that uh, if they are to carry on uh, capable of tapping onto the uh, hydrocarbon resources, that would mean that it's likely that their society and economy uh, would develop further rather than seeing their uh, entire hydrocarbon resources uh, entrapped uh, beneath the ground when it's going to be sort of the, uh, the call. Um, what was the term that you called? Uh, the stranded, stranded, stranded. stranded uh, resource asset, yeah. So that's the approach that the Japanese are taking now. But uh, if you see the Trump administration, which I don't think is that much interested in the environmental uh, consideration, uh, that may not fly well here in Washington. But we are doing our own job there. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting notion of, of that maybe Asia's big, big importers and consumers would start talking to one another and collaborating without the U.S. We always tend to think very U.S. centric on, on these issues. Nothing can happen unless the U.S. 
leads or is part of it. Uh, that would, from my perspective, would be a great thing. Uh, you see collaboration on LNG between Japan and South Korea, despite having a very difficult relationship. Uh, India, China, uh, I'm not familiar with that working group, but I'd be interested to know more about it. Uh, so maybe the region can move ahead on its own. I, I, think, I think what's kind of happening, though, is you have the Belt and Road Initiative channel, and you have the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy channel. Uh, and so the geopolitics of this thing are making some of that collaboration, you know, there's one or the other. Uh, how do you do something that doesn't get uh, undermined by that uh, geopolitical divide? And, and mm -hmm. uh, if I may quickly, um, so fairly soon after the, the uh, Great East, Eastern Japan earthquake and, and um, when uh, the LNG import bill was starting to pressure the Japanese uh, uh, Treasury, uh, Japan launched LNG producer consumer uh, uh, conference. And I, I think earlier on, um, you know, uh, there was uh, sort of a, um, I don't know if concern is the right way to say, but some, some wonder, in, in media pieces I, I remember reading how this might be sort of consumers cartel or consumers club uh, that may uh, um, make it, um, you know, that may give a bit of a, you know, um, headache to some of the uh, emerging suppliers. Um, in my view, I think that the Japanese did a, a very good job in um, opening up uh, and making sure that it was not seen as such sort of buyers club, uh, and trying to uh, um, sort of uh, be confrontational, if you will. But I guess the the. Uh, and I, I've been, uh, I had a pleasure of being there as a moderator uh, at one of the, the conferences. But it, it was, it, what was striking to me was that there were a lot of supplier country ministers that were there. But from the U.S. side, of, you know, there, there, there was a senior official there. But to the U.S., I mean, the, the, you know, the, the gas supplies belong to private companies. So, um, you know, of, of course, I think there are a lot of important messages that were sent by, you know, by being there, the, having a you know, senior official from Washington. But I think the, the, um, the, the nature of engagement was, uh, you know, by, uh, I guess, default quite different from, let's say, Qatari minister being there and, and acknowledging that they are f fully committed. It's their sort of a sovereign, you know, um, business more or less, and not, not in a legal sense, but uh, this is, you know, the, that's the major um, uh, engine for their, their economic growth and such. And even Australia had a very uh, strong show of, uh, 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 you know, uh, government uh, support. So in many ways, uh, the, the U.S. is anomaly in, in, in a way, um, but, you know, who knows? I mean, the, the you know, it's an it's a evolving uh, uh, scene, and so there's still a lot of things that both the suppliers and, and uh, buyers can experiment and, and sort of work towards um, common interests of having more competitive, um, well, common, but um, you know, uh, come up with something that's you know, um, mu of mutual interest. Um, so, thanks. Thank you. Alan? Hello, uh, my name is Alan Yu. I'm from the Center for American Progress. Um, this is a question for Professor Tanaka. I wanted to go back to the Japan Strategic Energy Plan, um, uh, and uh, I think many people are noticing uh, the Japanese target of trying to return uh, to 22 to 24 uh, percent nuclear by 2030, and uh, it just seems like uh, most people would recognize that that's not very realistic. Um, and I guess my question is, how do you see uh, what is the plan in the absence of uh, actually achieving that target? And uh, the other thing I noticed was uh, in your um, pie chart, uh, the increase in renewables was from 10% in, I think it was 2010, to 14% in 2030, which seems like a, a very flat uh, acceleration rate compared to what's happening in, in other uh, uh, industrialized countries, and I just wanted to wonder if you could comment to that as well. Right. Um, well, thank you for your com uh, question. By 2030, 2030, uh, 
the plan does stipulate that we need more uh, nuclear reactors to be on the grid. But uh, the reality, as we see today, is not that uh, is not such so. And the most recent development that by uh, only happened a month ago was that the nuclear uh, regulatory uh, agents, uh, the authority, has announced that uh, those uh, reactors that are already in operation, or that though are those are applying for the uh, restart of their uh, nuclear reactors have to compi uh, comply by their strict rules, not only about the, uh, the physical uh, structure, the safety of the uh, nuclear facilities, but also for the having a secondary uh, management uh, facility in case of disasters as well as terrorist attacks. And it's likely that none of the current working reactors are going to meet that target and that the uh, NRA has come quite strong and outspoken in this that they would Allow, uh, they would not allow the fur uh, further uh, uh, the um, uh, operation of these non-complying uh, non uh, reactors. So uh, having said that, and also with the aging of our nuclear reactors, which initially were designed for 40 years or less, are now coming to its, uh, uh, coming to its uh, life cycle. Now, uh, the authorities have looked into this. Uh, there are cases that it's going to be extended for another 20 years or so. But uh, by 2030, maybe we may not have much left to operate, regardless of how the regulation is going to look like in those days. Uh, is we may end up in seeing less and less reactors that are going to remain. And we are still trying to build new reactors, but most of them have been suspended since 2011. There are quite a few that is still in progress, but that way, that would be no way enough uh, to uh, manage the outgoing uh, aging uh, reactors. So in the end, what I'm trying to say is that this uh, latest uh, uh, energy, uh, strategic energy uh, policy in itself is a failure because it does not actually uh, uh, address that issue. And the last one, not the most recent one, the prior one was developed in 2014. And even back in 2014, the figures are just as we see it of today for the 2030 year, the target year. And in between, there had not been much, much of a progress on the nuclear facilities. And we're still, say, trying to hang on to that. And I think eventually this is sort of a uh, lack of conviction and also the determination of both the policy side and also the Japanese society to see what we want for 2030. The policy is still there, but we were still uh, maybe not ready to accept that there will be no reactors by 2030 or for even beyond 40. Please. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a critical question, and I guess the, the part, of, part of the answer is what happens in the case that nuclear isn't 20 percent? Uh, what's the default? And that's where you get into the coal LNG debate in Japan, as you know. And how much can you fill it with LNG? How much coal is, and they are still building some coal. Uh, and so I think there's still a really open debate and struggle over, you know, gradually coming to terms with a nuclear outcome and what's going to fill that hole. I mean, the, the ambition is for 22 to 24 percent renewable in power generation, so I think that's not un unambitious. But even, w even with the nuclear, you still have LNG coal, big slug of coal in there. Really a tough, tough set of problems. Thank you. Um. Yeah, one final question. Bob Dillon from the Atlantic Council. Just going to ask uh, Alan's question about renewables. Why don't they play a larger role in, in the future in the plan? Well, um, here I think the policy planners were quite realistic, rather say. Um, first of all, maybe they have some consideration of the major power company, companies who have actually been in control of the power grids, but had a lot of complaints about the conditions of the un volatile situation 
of the energy production from uh, renewables, especially when it comes to uh, solar PVs. Uh, in Japan, it's more, most about solar PVs rather than uh, large wind, uh, you know, wind farms. And that eventually causes a lot of uh, strain on the power grids. And the power companies are not willing to accept that. Uh, even though the, in the island of Kyushu, at one point, the capacity of the uh, solar power exceeded the entire requirement of the island itself. That that is going to cause a, I mean, uh, everybody's talking about that is going to cause a huge problem for the stability of the power grid. So I think that in that way, people are trying to be, uh, those who design this are quite realistic in trying to see that they don't expect a large amount of uh, renewables, especially solar PVs coming into the market as, uh, as, they, as, the, as the grid can afford. Maybe the technology could uh, afford that in the future, but as we see it today, it's not as ready as, the, as it's supposed to be. And the, you know, the, the grid's bifurcated in terms of the, the, the system, so you can't move it north to south or east to west very effectively given the bifurcated technical uh, grid. Um, the strain is that uh, Japan is an island, an archipelago, and at least there are four major parts of the archipelago that consists, and in between the mainland, Honshu, even just like uh, Michael just mentioned, the frequency differs from east to west or north to south. So there's a lot of constraints in moving the excess of power generated from one location or one island to the other. Uh, last year, we had a, another earth, major earthquake in the island of Hokkaido. Uh, the major coal-fired uh, power plant uh, stopped. I mean, it, it had to go undergo an emergency stop because of the instability of the uh, power grids. But then it took like two weeks to reboot them. And in between, there was a total lack of in electricity in the island of Hokkaido. A lot of, lot of people had to go uh, living uh, without electricity for a while. But there is a uh, power line connection with the mainland, but the capacity again is uh, really constrained, and there is not enough, uh, say, um, uh, ca capacity to move the electricity or connect the electricity, transform the electricity, transfer the electricity from the mainland to Hokkaido, and that happens here and there. So, yeah, quickly on this, the siding side as well, uh, you know, the Japan, the two thirds of Japan is, you know, is mountainous, so. When it comes to onshore wind, uh, you know, my understanding is the siding has been uh, that that sort of limits to some extent. You know, the ideal location um, offshore uh, wind is equally equally challenging, at least in the past, uh, given the strong uh, um, uh, uh, position that the the you know fishing industry has. Um, so. So maybe you know, uh, I think that those are some of the factors that are, you know we, we that do not tend to get into the renewables discussion we tend to have in the U.S. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come to our event. Um, the Asia Security Initiative Program. We're going to expand the body of work on um, Asian energy issues. So please um, stay connected, and I would like to thank you again um, to our. Panelists, thank you so much again and for uh, sharing your insight and, and, and your views and policy recommendation and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.